Hey everyone, for those of you who haven't been here before, my name is Derek Royden. I uh, write a weekly article for a website called nationofchange.org. I'm a freelance journalist, I guess, and I uh, also do a vlog like this, usually about once a week. I try to, uh, because I spend so much time reading, well, this is just what it is, I'm not being pretentious, uh, I've run across a lot of uh, interesting articles, so usually once a week I take a couple of them, or one of them if it happens to be a really long read, and uh, look at them using this blog as a platform. So, uh, without further ado, let's get to today's story, which is uh, from the uh, London Review of Books, kind of uh, one of my very favorite uh, journals, uh, kind of a, a more left-wing version of the New York Review of Books, uh, which uh, I think my last video, I took an article from that. So this is a long read, it's by uh, Stephen Mithen, and he's reviewing a book called Who We Are and How We Got Here by David Reich. It's from the uh, 13th of September issue of the LRB. So, uh, <coughs> Mithen begins. A scientific... Oh, and just one thing. Um, I'm going to be jumping around. Because this is a 16-page article, I'm going to be jumping around a little bit. But uh, I'm gonna, there's going to be a link to it below. So there's a lot of information that I'm going to pass over or miss so uh, you know if you have the time and and you're so inclined uh, please feel free to use the link below in order to read the actual article so uh, so myth and begins <clears throat> a scientific revolution is underway in the way we investigate and understand the past the extraction and analysis of ancient dna from human skeletal remains the field in which David Reich is a leading researcher is a technical advance that eclipses the advent of radiocarbon dating in the 1950s and is already transforming our knowledge, not only of human biological evolution, but also of human history and culture. It was Savante, and I apologize in advance if I say his name wrong, Pabo and his colleagues at the Mass Max Planck Institute for Evolutionary Anthropology in Leipzig who developed much of the technology for extracting DNA from ancient skeletal remains. Pabo's group were primarily concerned with the Neanderthals. At first, they focused on extracting mitochondrial DNA, or um, lowercase mt DNA, partly because its relative abundance increased the chances of successful extraction, and partly because of the frequency of mutations in this part of the genome all the better to establish the point of separation of the Neanderthals from modern human lineage. The problem with mtDNA is that since it tracks just a single female lineage, it provides only an extremely narrow window through which to view the past. The evidence is incomplete and potentially misleading. The real prize was to extract the complete Neanderthal genome. By 2007, armed with dramatically increased computing power and bones containing organic material with well-preserved DNA, Pabo was in a position to begin developing a method for whole genome extraction. He brought together an international team, which included David Reich. Reich then worked with Pabo until 2013, then left for Harvard to set up with Nieden Rohind, the first laboratory in the U.S. focused on whole genome ancient DNA. They industrialized the process of DNA extraction and analysis, and the result has been an exponential increase in data. In 2010, just five ancient human genomes were published. In 2014, the number was 38. But by August 2017, Reich's laboratory had published genome-wide data for more than 3,000 individuals. New data is now being generated at a pace that far outstrips publication. So he then goes to talk on to talk about um, the differences between uh, Neanderthal people and Homo sapiens. Um, some of the uh, interesting things uh, that we've learned with using these two new techniques. For example, um, I had no awareness of this, but um, actually people from East Asia actually tend to have a higher amount of Neanderthal DNA. Now, this seems unusual because from what we know from the archeological evidence, uh, it was actually in Europe was the main place where Neanderthals lived. So this is just interesting. It shows something kind of about the migrations of people, uh, whether they're Neanderthal or Homo sapien, which we're going to get to a little bit as we go on. <coughs> so uh, Mithen goes on to say, uh, throughout my career studying prehistory and for generations before that, archaeologists have argued over whether the spread of technology and cultures was caused by the spread of people, migration, or of ideas, acculturation. 
when the evidence takes the form of artifacts such as ceramic vessels with particular shapes and decorations, or lifestyles such as farming or metalworking, which appear to have originated in one place and are now found in another, it's virtually impossible to tell the difference between migration and acculturation. The spread of Neolithic farming from Anatolia into Europe is the classic case. Did this happen because indigenous hunter-gatherers in Europe gradually adopted wheat and barley, sheep and cattle, along with the, all the accompanying technology from farmers they encountered or heard about at the boundaries of their territories? Or was the spread of the Neolithic <coughs> excuse me, across Europe also caused by the migration of people, which gradually forced indigenous hunter-gatherers into marginal areas and ultimately led to their extinction? The same debate has been had over and over, not just about Neolithic Europe, but about different geographic regions, different transitions, and different time periods throughout human history. I think this is an interesting thing. Um, I don't know if it'll ever necessarily be provable, uh, how much is acculturation and how much is migration, but uh, he goes on, uh, Mithin goes on to uh, look at some different groups of uh, Neanderthal uh, discoveries, uh, especially in, in a cave in Russia, and uh, some pretty interesting stuff there. He then goes on to talk about um, kind of uh, Europeans or where modern Europeans come from. And he talks about uh, two groups uh, based on their pottery. Uh, one is called Corded Ware Culture and the other is called Bell Beaker Culture. So Reich's account of Europe between 50,000 and 5,000 years ago is just the start of a European story that continues with the origin and spread of the Bell Beaker Culture also defined on the basis of the particular shape and decoration of its ceramic vessels. This has validated the notion of the beaker folk, which I used to think was one of the most absurd hypotheses about British prehistory. It now seems that a mere 10% of the ancestry of Bronze Age people in Britain was from the local Neolithic population, and the remaining 90% from people in the Netherlands associated with the Bell Beaker culture. Reich's book isn't just a collection of stories about the histories of human populations. It's a fascinating case study of scientific revolution, the role of colleagues, of conferences, chance meetings, discoveries, technological innovations. What we do not yet sufficiently understand, notably the rate of mutation, what new methods are required, and so on. Reich also has interesting things to say about the way his discipline has over the years been caught up in politics. To take one example, Child, uh, who he referenced earlier, an earlier scientist, uh, I think from the 1930s, was not the first to associate the expansion of the corded ware culture with a people. Gustav Cosina, writing in 1919, proposed, proposed that the roots of Germanic and German-speaking people lay in the corded ware culture. The Nazis cited his ideas to claim legitimacy for their annexation of territories where the corded ware culture had been found. They also found the notion that culture spreads by migration useful in making the case for the biological superior, superiority of some peoples over others. When Reich and his colleagues were preparing their publication about a genetic link between the Yamnaya of Central Asia and the Corded Ware culture, several of the co-authors, including a German archaeologist, resigned for fear of being seen, quite erroneously, as validating Cosina's ideas. This is interesting because we don't often get a window into how um, science can very easily be politicized. <clears throat> uh, with Mithen goes on to say, in another case, there were concerns where when D ancient DNA data indicated that an influx of people described initially by Reich as West Eurasians into South Asia had made a major contribution to historical and present day Indian populations. The suggestion that the cultural achievements of South Asia might be partly attributable to Western Eurasians was considered politically unacceptable by Indian archaeologists. A potential crisis was averted when all parties agreed on the term ancestral North Indians rather than Western Eurasians for the incoming population, which then mixed with the people now labeled ancestral South Indians, who had a much longer presence in South Asia. <coughs> Excuse me. Unsurprisingly, North America is one of the most politically charged ar arenas for ancient DNA studies. Some indigenous Americans see genetic research as the latest attempt on the part of Europeans to enlighten them, having already taken their ancestors' bones and artifacts to display in museums. The Navajo have for forbidden the participation of tribe members in genetic studies, explaining in a document prepared for academic researchers 
that human genome testing is strictly prohibited by the tribe. Navajos were created by changing women. Therefore, they know where they come from or came from. In other cases, academics have found ways of working positively with Native Americans, showing them, for example, how DNA studies can demonstrate ancestral tribal links to skeletal remains. Now, of course, the idea that uh, indigenous people in Canada or the United States or really anywhere um, in the Western Hemisphere would uh, trust uh, uh, European and uh, white scientists or whatever you want to call it uh, is, you know, of course, something to consider. It's uh, it'd be a very it'd be a, a very difficult thing, I would think, after so much terrible and tragic history to have trust in these communities. Um, so later on, Mithen goes on, uh, the, genomic, the genomic revolution is providing hard evidence for substantial biological variation between populations. As it moves forward, Reich argues, we will increasingly be able to translate that variation into behavioral and cognitive differences, while fully recognizing that any given trait is produced by the interaction of multiple genes and environmental factors. The indications are that these biological differences will not square with traditional racial stereotypes. The truth is that the language and modes of thinking we have all inherited are simply unsuited to handling the avalanche of genetic data that will shortly be available. Reich's view, which he reiterated in the New York Times in March, is that if we abstain from laying out a rational framework for discussing differences among populations, we risk losing the trust of the public. We leave a vacuum that gets filled by pseudoscience. And I mean, we have seen this in the past. Uh, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, I think it was a really interesting article. I hope uh, you all enjoyed it. And uh, I'll maybe go and visit the LRB and look at some of the stuff they have there. Also, please check out nationofchange.org. I should have an article appearing there tomorrow. So have a great day and always remember.